Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic Food Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and you can also visit our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. Today's show is sponsored by coronatools.com, the nation's leader in garden and landscaping tools. Listeners of The Organic View can receive 20% off their coronatools.com purchase by using the coupon code ORGVIEW. That's O-R-G-V-I-E-W. For more promotional offers, please visit our website at www.theorganicview.com. And don't forget to check out our contest section. Since 2011, we've been producing weekly segments of the Neonicotinoid View, We've discussed a number of startling topics from massive honeybee deaths to the steady decline of the North American hummingbird. Recently, it has been discovered that neonicotinoids can now be found in honey. What is even more disturbing is new research concluding that there is over a 75% decline over 27 years in total of flying insect biomass in protected areas. So on today's show, these are some of the subjects that we're going to be talking about. So I'd like to welcome to the show my co-host, Colorado beekeeper, Mr. Tom Theobald. Hello, Tom. Hello, June. From sunny Colorado, we're having some beautiful fall weather, and it's a great time to be outside working. I've been working on the wood pile and cleaning up the garden and making the last planting of winter rye. The hummingbirds left two weeks ago, and those little tiny little birds are headed all the way to Central America. So I'm just uh, enjoying fall. Spent the day today working with the bees. Have some things that concern me, and maybe we can touch on those as we talk. But uh, it's a nice time of the year. It is, and you know, this is the time of the year when we should be planning for the next growing season and just thinking about what we're going to be doing for all the different things that we need to do to prepare. And what you would normally do 30 years ago has significantly changed because things are not as they were when it comes to protecting your bees. Tom, could you just share with our listeners some of the significant changes that have taken place since you first became a beekeeper? Well, sure. Let's get right into the bees. Um, I've spent the past several days going through the, the bees, and that's typical for what a beekeeper would be doing at this time of the year. We want to assure that they have a good population, that they're not uh, suffering from any problems, and that they have a good store of honey because we still have enough warm weather left that we can feed them up to a certain degree. Um, the thing that got me started on this neonicotinoid odyssey was what I call a break in the fall brood cycle, which occurs in September and October. And I discovered that in the fall of 2007. And my hypothesis was that it was coming from contaminated corn pollen stored in August when it's in surplus and then tapped toward the end of September when the natural floral spectrum begins to shrink. And because it's contaminated with the neonicotinoids, it does what the research told us in France in 1998. It uh, compromises the fertility of the queen and the viability of the brood. The result is that when the bees start feeding that contaminated corn pollen, the queen stops laying viable brood, may stop laying altogether. This is a critical time in the annual life of a colony of bees because this is when the, a colony produces the winter bees. And the winter bees are physiologically different than the summer bees. They have larger fat bodies and they're, they've evolved to carry the spark of life through the winter. So a beekeeper may go to a colony and it looks like it has a very good population and may in fact have a good population, but those are mostly summer bees. In a month, they'll have come to the end of their natural life, and if there aren't any winter bees being produced, then the colony quickly dwindles and becomes a winter casualty. And 
I'm seeing this break in the fall brood cycle in the bees this fall, and uh, it concerns me greatly. I think what you've just described really says a lot as far as what many beekeepers have experienced. Um, And now, with this latest news, I mean, to a certain degree, a lot of people are in shock. I know you and I, even though it's very grim, it's something that unfortunately is sad. It's it, it's a sad reality. I think, uh, you know, re- reality is relative. I think for older beekeepers like myself, who've been in the game for a period of time, we, uh, we go back to before these problems began, and we have a and a good appreciation for what's been lost and what isn't going right. For a lot of the newer beekeepers, this is what beekeeping has been. This is their entire experience, and they're perhaps not as perplexed by these losses as we are. They don't have the same frame of reference as beekeepers who have 20 or 30 years of experience. But we're facing problems that we've never had to face before, and uh, we don't seem to be gaining on it at all. Well, I don't know how that would even be possible for you to even try, especially since neonicotinoids are the most widely spread used pesticide in the world. They're also very, very profitable, so pulling them off the shelf isn't going to happen anytime too soon. However, If you look at this new research, I can't even describe words that can make sense of this. This, it's surreal. It's something that you would think would be in a Stephen King novel, not something coming out of the scientific community. And it's not just one scientist. It's it's a panel of top-notch scientists that have been focusing on this for quite some time. And I just want to read... um, a couple of points and it says 80 percent and this is these are some point I want to read some of the points from the paper and it says 80 percent of wild plants are estimated to depend upon insects for pollination while 60 percent of birds rely on insects as a food source that's huge and to take such a key element and reduce it drastically is going to have tremendous impact on the ecosystem. We're, t- we're tampering with the very basis of life for profit. I- I've made the comparison often with my farmer friends when we're talking about pesticides and honeybees, and I've, I've made reference to their shiny new pickup truck, and I said, you know, you probably have 20 or $25 worth of oil in that truck, But without the oil, that truck isn't of much value to you. And I said, the bees, the honeybees, and many other pollinators are the oil in the engine of agriculture. They're the oil in the engine of the ecosystem. And we're devastating the lower end of the food chain. And yet we continue to get articles from the chemical companies, engineered by the chemical companies, that try to divert people's attention or excuse these things away. And unfortunately, the EPA is right in there with them. The portion of the EPA that we deal with, the Office of Pesticide Programs, was captured by the chemical industry long ago, and they just basically carry out the bidding of the chemical companies. It's very frustrating to the employees, I know that. And uh, National Public Radio just did a... uh, a frontline program called War on the EPA, and uh, it, it exemplifies some of the frustrations that these people are feeling. It's a horrible situation. You know, I think many of those EPA employees, maybe most of those EPA employees, are working for the EPA in part because they want to do the right thing. They want to protect the environment, and they've, they've been grossly mismanaged. Well... EPA, it's an agency that is operated by the government, and it's not the type of job where you're talking about big bucks and tremendous power, so on and so forth, as far as these, the, the, the jobs 
that you're referring to by the employees, and I'm sure that there are many employees, but the bottom line is, is that if you're working for an agency that has direct impact over the lives of so many people, countless people, and you're seeing injustices that are inhumane, not to mention can impact society and create mass devastation. I think the apologetics has got to stop as far as these employees because you're seeing some of them coming out with books, which is great after the fact, but while they're there, you know, I I, I don't know. I, I don't exactly want to get into an argument or I don't exactly want to get into a discussion about it, but the bottom line is is that we need to stop making excuses for them. EPA needs massive restructure. EPA is not doing what EPA should be doing, bottom line. It doesn't matter if they have the greatest employees in the world. It doesn't matter if they have the worst employees in the world. The bottom line is they're not doing their job, and they are obligated to do their job, and they just have not. They didn't do their job in the last administration, and they're certainly not doing it in this administration. At what point are we going to get to where EPA is going to do something? I think looking for the EPA to do something is not the answer. I think people need to start speaking up. People need to start educating each other. People need to start speaking to their elected officials and saying, okay, this needs to be a priority. I uh, sympathize with the EPA employees, I guess, because I think that while many of them might like to speak out you know they have children in college or in school they have mortgages they have car payments you said it sound like randy oliver when he was he was uh well, talking but, about but even when he was talking me, about industry let I, me finish let me finish the thought you know maybe one of the answers to this is to create some sort of an organization which would give these people a chance to reveal what's going on but do it anonymously so that they're protected against retribution from what appears to be a very corrupted management. Um, they, I'm sure many of them want to speak out, and if given an opportunity to do so without jeopardizing their careers, I think they would, and we would have an avalanche of exactly the evidence that we're looking for. I'm I sorry, honestly don't want to spend time talking about EPA. Honestly, I think this is a bunch of crap. Okay. Well, I, I okay. just do. I, I, I think it's let's off. Let's go. Let's move on then. Let's I move think on. it's off. Well, it's just that it keeps coming up. It's just EPA. It's part of the problem, though. I mean, if we don't correct what the regulators are doing, there's not much hope for any of this. Yeah, but to say that, well, these people have families, this and that. Yeah, you know what? How many of the scientists have families and they stepped up to the plate and look what happened to them? Most of them haven't, though. Most of them haven't stepped up to the plate. Well, some of them are willing to. Some of them are not. But the bottom line, well, you know, but to say, oh, well, like this whole apologetics scenario. I'm not trying to apologize for them. I'm trying to suggest some avenue in which they could reveal what's going on. I don't think I don't think that's going to make a difference. I think we need to have a massive boycott of products that come from these companies number 1, number 2, people need to speak up. I mean, look at this Harvey Weinstein thing, how it blew up. Oh, and all yeah. of a sudden people are speaking up. Who really knew anything about him before that? But because people are speaking up, things are changing. Mm-hmm. How come people aren't speaking up? I don't know. You know, maybe some of them are listening and they have better ideas than we do. I don't know. I think in part, in part, we're in a partnership with our listeners. We we don't have all the answers. We don't even have all the questions. But we we have a wide listenership of all kinds of experiences, and they need to do more than just listen. I couldn't agree more, Tom. But the bottom line is, is that there are a lot of people out there who feel, well, let somebody else deal with it. Because they yeah. have their own problems that they're dealing with. Not everybody wants to be out in the front line. I yeah, mean, well. look, look at every single thing that's wrong in this world from the drug epidemic. There's issues all over the world with that. And you have some concerned citizens who are willing to fight the good fight. And you have others that feel, well, it's not my backyard. What do I care? Mm-hmm. Well, when it comes to the global decline of our pollinators it affects everybody mm-hmm. in regards to this this new paper 
One statement also that is important for our listeners to hear is, it says, the ecosystem services provided by wild insects have been estimated at $57 billion annually in the USA. Clearly, preserving insect abundance and diversity should constitute a prime conservation priority. But why is it that it doesn't? Why is it that doing anything good for the environment is not something that's profitable? It's the last thing that people think about. But yet, if you're selling chemicals, which will basically contaminate an entire region, it's profitable. What is wrong with this? Well, this is global, you know. They're tampering with the fabric of life. That's what we need to recognize. They're tampering with the fabric of life for profit at our expense. The the uh, medical community is beginning to get on board with these problems and beginning to discover that particularly with children, which are at the most vulnerable stage, we may be paying a very, very heavy price. Not we may, we done. are. And no? it's with it's with the, dis- the disappearance of how many species. It's with the problems that we have. I mean, you could grow the most beautiful flowers, but it doesn't mean that you're going to attract honeybees or butterflies or any other pollinators for that matter because everything's so contaminated. It's literally like something out of a Stephen King novel. Yes, it is. Well, Tom, that's why we do these shows, because no one else out there is taking the time, making the effort, and connecting with the people that are doing the research, the people that are truly trying to stop this widespread contamination And it's important that the information get out there. So I just want to say thank you so much for joining me today and for all of your efforts to educate other people, especially new beekeepers. Well, thank you, Joan. I know you go to great sacrifice to to do what you're doing. And uh, this provides a venue in which we can talk about these things and uh, at least inform a certain portion of the population. These are very serious challenges, and we're finding these chemicals everywhere we look in greater and greater amounts. But uh, it's fall, beautiful blue sky today. I worked on the woodpile this morning, went out and worked with the bees this afternoon, and it's a good time to be alive. So we move on, do the best we can. So I hope everybody joins us next week. We have no idea what the... uh, topics will be but i'm sure that it'll be something very interesting it it seems to be an unending challenge so tune in next week and we'll see you all then thanks tom and folks if you have any questions please write to us at questions at theorganicview.com also if you are a beekeeper and have experienced any massive bee losses please write to us we'd love to hear from you Thank you for tuning in. This has been June Stoyer with the Organic View Radio Show. Have a great afternoon.